I'm going to be talking extensively about Scotland tonight and Scotland's independence struggle, but I think it's really important that we remember, and as a Scottish person, I acknowledge that the Scottish people, from top to bottom, benefited, especially Scottish capitalists, best benefited massively from the British colonial project. And while we do want our independence, we have to accept that we were a big part of the British colonial project across the world, including Australia, and our material wealth compared to colonised people, relatively, is based on that. So we need a, a bit of modesty when it comes to our independence struggle. Um, first of all, I'll tell you a bit about myself. So my first political memory is when I was eight. And I remember, for some reason, being deeply opposed to the Iraq war, to the bottom of my being. And I remember a lot of young people eight, that are around eight years old being highly politicized uh, compared to maybe what we would have been over the Iraq war. And I remember developing a, fe a, a feeling that something wasn't quite right. And then I became a bit of an environmentalist. Well, as much as you can be an environmentalist when you're 12. Um, and actually, I remember um, the first time the Scottish National Party, which is the, pr the biggest pro-independence party in Scotland, won the election in Scotland. I remember feeling, I remember, don't, I remember feeling that I was against independence. And I remember feeling that um, you know, it was divisive and things like that. Actually, over the next year, I was convinced that the only way we could have like, you know, we could stop wars and the only way we could have a sustainable future was by the Scottish people um, gaining their self-determination and breaking away from the United Kingdom and it's 300 years of colonialism and imperialism. So that's my story. This is my first slide. Um, I'll just point out a few things. Um, we have um, Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonald with Momentum members at the top, um, which is pretty cool. We have a picture from Freedom Square, or George Square. It's now called Freedom Square by the independence movement. And you can see like a ton of different banners for independence, but also against fracking and against austerity. I'll go into that more of that later. And then you see this is the final March for Independence in 2013. And I'm pretty sure I'm actually in this for some reason, like, but you can't see me. I can, I'm holding the banner. I'm just like a really small child. <laughs> so, <laughs> and this is, this was a 30,000 person rally um, from lots of different groups. So let's move on to the next slide. So the background to Scottish independence, and this isn't fully comprehensive. This is just a basic run through. So the Labour Party in Scotland um, was politically hegemonic um, from the 50s onwards. And as a result, um, Scottish independence wasn't a demand that a lot of people had. It was pretty fringe. Even when I was about 12 or 13, it was a pretty fringe demand. I remember even in a fairly working class and um, lower middle class area being in a very small minority. But that changed. Um, so yeah, in the 70s, the Labour government gave Scotland a referendum on whether they wanted a parliament. And Scotland voted yes. However, there was a clause that 40% of the Scottish people had to vote for independence or they wouldn't, you know, of the total. And that's, that's bloody ridiculous because that would need a turnout of like 80% or like 70%. So we didn't get our parliament and instead we got over a decade of Thatcher and Thatcherism that we didn't vote for. We had deindustrialization, and I grew up all around and seeing, going around my county, which is Fife, just north of Edinburgh, seeing the effects of the, of the economic policies of Thatcher, of communities devastated. I think it's an important fact that we remember there was a point when about 2% of Scotland was withdrawing from um, heroin and other such hard drugs. The effect on the working class was absolutely horrendous. Um, however, at the end of that time, there was a lot of unity in, um, coming together in Scottish society. And from the Church of Scotland down to the Trotskyists in militant that were just, in, I think, in the process of being thrown out the UK Labour Party, they came together over a common cause. And the common cause was the poll tax. And Scotland was the guinea pig of the poll tax. 
Thatcher decided that she was going to put the poll, poll tax on the Scots. The poll tax was essentially like local government rates. However, the poll tax made it from a slightly progressive system, you know, with gradiated, into a flat rate. And the Scottish people basically said no. And that we were the epicenter and the beginning of the resistance against the poll tax, which happened from the Liberal Democrats to the Communist Party to all the churches. And there was a mass um, peaceful movement against the poll tax, and that was up there. That actually sparked movements across the rest of the United Kingdom, and that was part of the end for Thatcher. In addition, um, the Scottish people have always had a grievance and it's one of the grievances that means the most to me, is the fact that the British nuclear deterrent is kept on our soil. Within 40 kilometers of Glasgow, a city of well over one million people when you count the whole conurbation. And is that essentially saying that Scottish working class lives don't matter in Glasgow? That, in, that you know, a major target for a nuclear attack is right near one of our cities. And 70% of the Scots like consistently opposed Trident and that was a that so Scottish society was starting to become united not so much around the Trident but definitely around the poll tax and when Labour got back in power we got a proper referendum and we got a parliament so this was the first time we had home rule in just under 300 years and that was pretty cool and you know the, the Scottish Socialist Party which were you know people coming out of the tradition of Trotskyism um, some of you will know the Scottish Socialist Party they're still around and the Greens made big gains in the Parliament and did the Social Democratic um, Scottish National Party um, while Labour did put in a few reforms and it's one of the most interesting one is the land reform in the Highlands they started to go a bit um, they start to um, really alienate thousands of working class Scottish people, um, especially young people, and that was partially over imperialism, so the war in Iraq, also, you know, Trident, as I've already said, and also, as time went on, siding with the Tories against independence, and hence siding with the Tories for austerity. So, next slide. Um, actually, can we go back a slide? I've got a funny picture to show you. It's actually pretty horrendous, but that bottom photo, you probably can't see it, um, that's during the independence campaign, so this is a bit skipped forward in time, and that's the leader of the Scottish Labour Party in front of ASDA, which is Scotland's Walmart. ASDA, the day before, had announced that in an independent Scotland, prices would hike. So they went for a photo opportunity. So the Scottish Labour Party killed themselves. Um, next slide, please. So yeah, the bedroom tax, and this was a major course of consternation. So in 2007, the Scottish Nationalists were elected. They didn't have a majority. However, then us, the Tories came in in Britain in 2010, and austerity began to bite. And in Scotland, the bedroom tax was probably the least popular, the most unpopular one of these um, parts of austerity. The bedroom tax is called the spare room subsidy. And it's the idea that we lower the housing, the housing benefit price by um, essentially encouraging, uh, the government would say, encouraging um, people to move to a house that has the number of bedrooms equal to the number of people in the house. However, that's not possible because a lot of people have kids at university that come back. A lot of people have elderly relatives. And in the case of my own county in Fife, there were 36,000 social houses where families lived out of about a quarter of a million people. And not a single one of them had one bedroom. So a huge number of people were met with a £15 bedroom tax a week on the housing benefits. Um, in addition, we had massive suffering and community um, we had massive suffering and community anger over the rest of the austerity and food and the unemployment and the fact there was no economic policy for the north. We were kind of left behind, and food banks began to set up all over the United Kingdom in every town and village. Um, this caused increased swinging to the nationalists who started to take some solid social democratic positions while at the same time um, getting into bed with the head of Scotland's biggest private bus company owner. So that went the Scottish nationalists' um, good transport policy. That went out the window and getting into bed with a lot of the oil companies. But they did take 
some solid social democratic positions. And as a result, they won a massive majority. That's the leader of the Scottish National Party, Alex Salmon. And over there is a picture of the swing in the Scottish election back in 2011, I think it is. Can we move to the next slide, please? OK, so, um, so I'm going to have to put my glasses on here because I broke my normal glasses. Sorry, I look like an ASIO agent. Um, <laughs> So the campaign, or, so the independence campaign was on. The Scottish Nationalists had a majority. In fact, the Greens were for independence as well, and there was an independent for independence. So there was actually a big majority in our parliament for independence. And the campaigners from the social democratic top, but down to the real campaigners on the ground, started to take up the people's line. The people's line was the bedroom tax needs to go, and then secondly, we need to get rid of Trident. And thousands got involved in community activism. The Yes campaign was set up in a way that would engender that kind of stuff. And after years of, you know, like, polit of the depoliticization of society, we saw a spurt of stalls, town hall meetings, and small local rallies, door knocking. And this massively increased the pro-independence vote and sentiment among the working class, especially in Glasgow and Dundee. And Glasgow, historically, was not a nationalist city. Glasgow, the nationalists occasionally won one seat and Labour would win the rest of the seats. So, as well as the main Yes Scotland organisation, lots of little organisations, um, which became medium-sized organisations in many cases, sprung up. So, we had Green Yes. So, the Greens in Scotland, I should probably tell you, are officially eco-socialist and far to the left of the Australian Greens. And the same is true for the, the English Green Party. So, the Greens um, had an independent campaign for independence, as did Radical Independence, which was a coalition of a lot of pro-independence, left-wing, often Marxist-like ca um, campaigners. We then had Labour for Independence, which um, most their members have now joined the Scottish Socialist Party, as far as I know, but that was a socialist caucus in the Labour Party campaigning for independence. The Scottish Socialist Party, which along with Labour for Independence and Radical Independence, did some sterling work um, going into... Um, often people, like often most the, many of the organisers came from social housing communities, going back into the social housing and talking to people about the bedroom tax, agitating and building a really strong working class movement. Um, we also had Asians for Independence, Africans for Independence, and they took a very strong line against imperialism and things like the war in Iraq, but also on making Scotland, you know, the potential of making a country where refugees could be welcome. Um, the Yes campaign made some massive errors and this came from its lack of democracy and the fact that the SNP, um, who weren't really that social democratic, um, essentially ruled the roost. And their discourse about um, keeping the pound, keeping the queen and indecisiveness on how pensions were going to be worked out, there's a strong argument that lost the referendum, potentially. And in a future referendum, there's strong sentiment that there should be a democratic Yes Scotland organisation with elected delegates from all the pro-independence organisations, or that the socialists should, and Greens and others should campaign separately from the Scottish National Party and put forward a strong line for a Scottish Socialist Republic. Um, then Project Fear. So I told you about the ASDA incident where they said they were going to hoof their prices up. Well, Project Fear came from all over the world. Um, we had talk that the nuclear bases would be kept in Scotland by the British Army as a sovereign base area, like in Cyprus. We had talk that um, Scotland would not be allowed to join into you know, the European project, and nobody would trade with Scotland. Barack Obama made some comment about like he didn't want independence. Um, the Labour Party shamefully shipped about 200 MPs up to Scotland from England to campaign against independence. And they were gleefully reporting when the bank said, oh, we're going to move down to England um, if, you do, you know, if you declare independence. And it's kind of interesting because, you know, they, they said, you know, oh, Scotland's nothing without the United Kingdom. You, you can't survive alone. But why did they want to keep us that much? Why did they want to keep our oil? Why did they want to, you know, the fact we provide a lot of oil to the United Kingdom, the fact we have, like, 
some very crucial defense bases, obviously were valuable, you know, and obviously we have an economy that could thrive post-independence, especially under a socialist republic. Can we go to the next slide, please? Right, I'm going to um, skip over these videos, but maybe come back to them at the end, see how we're doing time-wise. Um, so it was a tactical failure. We lost the referendum, and in my view, that was down to the Scottish National Party and an overwhelming project fear. And I think this is something we have to get ready for as leftists. When we um, bring forward a campaign, when, we, w when it looks like we're going to gain something, capitalism is going to attack us at left, right, and centre, and is going to, you know, the, the global media will turn on us, the domestic media will turn on us. The BBC um, produced some very biased content. Virtually all the papers were against Scottish independence. They were cornered. But they won Glasgow, they won Dundee, they won part of Lanarkshire, and they won Dumbartonshire. Sadly, everywhere else in Scotland, all the other counties, voted no. However, working class um, districts across Scotland had very high pro-independence votes. And the independence vote at the end was 45%. And there were points in the past in my childhood where the pro-independence vote would have been down at 25% to 30%. So that was a massive increase, despite being under assault from like in the rest of the United Kingdom, from being under assault from capitalism. 45% of Scots didn't blink, and I'm incredibly proud of that. Um, uh, so when we look at what went, so it was a tactical failure, but as you know, the Scottish National Party cleared Labour out of um, the UK Parliament. There's one Labour MP left, which is pretty funny, to be honest. Um, I'm not a big supporter of the SNP, but like, it's pretty funny. And um, the fact that they campaigned on hope, even the Social Democratic candidate, this was a very hope-driven campaign, hope that we could we could build something better than austerity, that we could, um, you know, create a country that wouldn't be like a major imperialist country like invading countries. Um, and the idea that the wealth of the country would be used for the people was very key to the independence campaign. Um, so yeah, there was a massive turnout and the sentiment's been sustainable. 45% of Scots have consistently supported independence since the referendum, despite project fear continuing in a lesser extent. So it's only a matter of time. Can we go to the next slide, thanks? So, the dream never dies, and that's a quote from our First Minister, Alex Salmon. Not his biggest fan, but I think it's a, it's a quote that kind of describes how I feel about the independence movement. Um, so there is now large, consistent support for Scottish independence, and that support is overwhelmingly left-wing, social democratic, and a large proportion of that support actively wants levels of socialism in our country. Um, so there's big support, not majority support yet, for a second independence referendum um, due to aus continued austerity. Um, so things like the trade union bill, where they're going to make it much more difficult and in some cases almost impossible to strike and hold a picket. And the tax credits, where the UK government has decided to cut um, tax credits to working families. And that's only... That's only increased and strengthened sentiment for independence. Um, breaking the vow, a vow of devolution and self-government powers was given to Scotland by the main, three main party leaders. Um, and that vow has not been delivered. It's been pitifully delivered. And the Scottish MPs were locked out of the process of making the new self-government settlement. So it's an absolute farce, and 90% of Scotland knows it, even the people that voted no, and would still vote no, know it's a farce. And also, the EU pull out. Now, I'm pretty ambivalent on the EU, but most Scots are pretty pro-EU, as they see it maybe as a counterbalance to the racist and xenophobic policies of the Conservatives and UKIP down south, although I don't know about that. but. They think like a pull out of the EU would um, prompt a second independence vote. There's general feeling. There's a f minority of people that are like, we need a unilateral declaration of independence now. And you can find them on Facebook. And it's good fun to like watch what they write, but they're, f they're full of crap. Um, and then, but most, I think a large proportion of Scottish people are biding their time till we get consistently nearing 60% um, in the opinion polls and something like that and then it's time to strike and have a large majority of the Scottish people vote for independence which I think and hope is 
poten is potentially possible. So the surge, the surge is massive. So the SNP is now the third biggest party in the whole of the United Kingdom. They have 120,000 members, I think, which Scotland's only about five and a half million people. So imagine if 2% of Australia was in a political party. That's back to, you know, 1950s and 1940s level of political party membership. Um, also, the Greens quadrupled in size and the Scottish Socialist Party quadrupled in size. And actually, um, there was something like the Green Party down in England kind of actually benefited from the surge in community project politics and, um, you know, general like socialistic politics. And actually, the Green Party down in England had a massive increase in membership. Um, which was interesting. And the Scottish Socialist Party started to talk, a bigger Scottish Socialist Party started to talk with other left-wing activists um, in the Scottish Left Project, which had a lot of people that broke off from the Scottish, I don't know, from the Socialist Worker Party years ago when the Socialist Worker Party became an absolute disgrace. And a lot of people in Scotland broke off and they started to find unity with the Scottish Socialist Party and a few other leftists that had been, in the, had been in the Scottish Socialist Party previously, and they formed RISE, which is Respect, Independence, Socialism, and Environmentalism. Um, kind of quite heavily inspired by Syriza. I honestly don't know how that's going to go, because, like, I don't know. But the, the Greens and RISE and the SNP are all guns blazing going into the next Scottish election. It looks like the Scottish National Party will gain a majority, but it lo also looks like SNP and Greens will make some gains as well. Um, there was a large-scale politicization of the youth in our society, and not just around independence, around other issues. Huge levels of young people joining political parties and getting involved in the radical independence campaign. Um, the top picture is Hands Across the Fourth, Hands Across Our Fourth, which was an anti-fracking movement in Scotland, including many members of the SNP that rebelled against their own party's indecisiveness over fracking, because the SNP were like umming and ahhing over whether to ban fracking. And they got a thousand, I think it was a thousand people in the end to form a human chain across the bridge. And there's now a strong anti-fracking campaign in Scotland, and fracking's probably not going to happen in Scotland. There's currently a moratorium. Let's see if it sticks. And this is the Hope Over Fear campaign, run by Tommy Sheridan, who has an interesting history. Um, uh, no longer in the Scottish Socialist Party. Happened when I was about nine, so I'm not going to think about that too much. Um, but he, um, he, he's now in his own party called Solidarity. And they um, ho held many Hope Over Fear rallies. And whatever people think of Tommy Sheridan, the Hope Over Fear rallies have been a major way of keeping the flame of independence going. Um, and there's a lot of people involved in those campaigns that aren't Tommy Sheridan. Um, <laughs> which is good because, like, Tommy Sheridan's a bit of a, a maverick if you don't know him and has a bit of a checkered past and not somebody a lot of people want to associate with. But we have to accept there's a huge number of, like, very good activists in um, Hope Over Fear that are keeping the flame alive and the dream will never die. Um, so, yeah, a huge amount for clever, pro clever, you know, advertising propaganda and mass action, you know, going back to community politics. Um, we will eventually run independence, I'm almost certain. Can we go to the next slide, please? So now, as you can see, graphic design is really my definite talent. So, so, we're, so mass action also worked down south in England, and the Scottish independence campaign um, was happening all the while when there were sh massive student protests down south in England over the mass uh, tripling of fees, I'm pretty sure. There's a picture up there of students um, in a book block where they made massive shields to protect themselves from the police made out of cardboard painted as books. There was the anti-fracking campaign, and there were campaign gr groups outside the Labour Party um, called um, People's Assembly Against the Cuts, and Tony Benn founded an organization called Coalition of Resistance. A lot of good activists, very young as well, got involved in that. And recently we've seen the junior doctor strike over um, an attack on the conditions of junior doctors and mass levels of activism and striking among Br Britain's junior doctors. Um, all this while, so since Tony Blair won the 1997 UK election back, um, the Labour Party have moved significantly to the right and a lot of activists had left, a lot of members had left and they relied on a passive membership. And then up in Scotland, you know, there was all this civil engagement and, you know, mass action going on. And then down, 
But in England, you've also got all these organisations outside the Labour Party. And then Jeremy Corbyn, after Labour has a dismal performance in the UK election in 2015. Jeremy Corbyn, who's a long-time left-wing London MP, who has a proud history of um, battling against apartheid, um, of opposing racism, opposing war, and being on the side of the poor very consistently, decides to run a campaign for leadership. And a lot of young people get behind him. And, yeah, and... They were kind of very lucky because the Labour Party had just changed its constitution. So there was actually a free vote across all the membership, across all the trade union affiliates, across all the MPs and across all the, mem the, you know, the normal members. But beforehand, the MPs had a massively inflated say. And now it was one member, one vote. And the MPs like, mostly wanted um, one of the neoliberal candidates to win. Um, however, the people who were incensed by austerity and... Um, the wars we were getting into, the young people involved in some of these organizations as well stopped the war, solidly got behind Jeremy Corbyn. And yeah, they, won, they got 200,000 votes and like the op they got 60% of the vote and a pretty resounding thumping victory. So next slide. So you could say there were the campaign for Jeremy Corbyn winning the leadership of the Labour Party had some similarities, maybe not many, but some similarities with the Scottish independence campaign. Um, so, at its core, it was anti-austerity and plugged into general anger over things like the bedroom tax, tax credit cuts, but also had a strong anti-imperialist element, um, so being anti-war and anti-nuclear weapons. Um, and also, they took politics back to the street and took the people's line over these issues and took them to the streets, into town halls, and, in, and with clever use of social media and running stalls, and bringing back a type of politics that you know, the Labour Party had abandoned. Um, also, the strong message of hope, not negative campaigning, and not necessarily constant you know, infighting, although... Well, whether I agree with that or not, but I think it was really important that they both ran on a very strong hope basis. Um, they both had Project Fear. So Jeremy Corbyn, apparently um, being labelled now labelled a terrorist sympathiser, and I should state that the Jeremy Corbyn project is not over, and he's in very great danger of being purged by his own Labour MPs, who are very right-wing on the whole, and part of the Blairite kind of tradition. So there's Project Thea, the whole media was against him, even like supposedly left-wing publications like The Guardian, like um, supported the neoliberal, one of the neoliberal ca candidates. But he got a 60% victory, and that was, uh, that was uh, you know, it's a clearer victory than the Scottish independence referendum, but I see the, r the independence campaign as a victory on the way to the final victory which is also a victory on the way to the final victory of a Scottish Socialist <laughs> Republic, which is also a victory on the way to internationalism. And yeah. Um, so what's coming up in the future, in north and south of the border? So we've got the future, we've got the war in Syria, massively unpopular among the, the British people, especially among the Scots, the working class, and the youth, um, and especially people that fit all three categories of them. Um, and Jeremy Corbyn's been against that. However, he did not whip all his Labour MPs and this division in the Labour Party. Let's see how that works out. Maybe people have questions on that and ideas. Um, there's increased resistance against the task credits, youth unemployment, and the North and the Celtic nation, the North of England and the Celtic nations have really been left behind when it comes to the UK's recovery. Like some districts of the city of London where banking's really big have made it back and there's, you know, a bit of like some loads of gentrified cafes popping up in some areas. But there's still huge parts of the United Kingdom that have been in years of recession in reality. So left unity that's a question that was a political party that started in england and now looks maybe it's irrelevant or maybe it'll come back you know um, they voted not to join the labor party but they voted to not stand candidates against them so let's see how that goes corbyn and independence because corbyn corbyn says he's not a unionist and he respects scotland's push for self-determination but he's not pro-independence and i don't know how this is going to work um the Blairites within the Labour Party, are they going to purge? The media's on their side. And what happens if they do purge? And can Corbyn purge them first? And the EU referendum that is looming over Britain and how, how we should vote, because on one hand, look what the EU did to Greece and look at how the EU cements austerity, permanent austerity. We should vote against it. But on the other hand, look at how 
pulling out the EU would lead to Britain being able to adopt draconian anti-asylum seeker and anti-migrant laws. So that's an open question. Um, so yeah, there's lots of open questions. I'm really interested to see what people think. And I would recommend if you want to know more about the Scottish independence campaign, join the Facebook group Bella Caledonia. It's very fun. It's very controversial. Um, it's sometimes a bit of a bruising match. It's quite a, it can be quite a nice community as well. And a lot of different, there's a lot of people from the SNP, the Greens, Rise, even, um, you know, Hope Over Fear. So a lot of different activists coming forward. So that's a good way to like find out a little bit what's happening in Scotland, but it's quite a skewed view as well. Thanks very much, conference.